Well, if you've come back a second time, uh, thank you for coming back. It's always uh, good to have you. It's Saturday the 18th of April. Now, quite a few interesting things that have struck me about the evolution of this pandemic from around the world. So let's start looking at some of those now. Now, the first country I wanted to highlight is the Netherlands. Now, the Netherlands has got um, 30, just over 30,000 cases and the death rate appears high. But the Netherlands is counting all of the deaths here. So they're actually doing a very thorough job like Belgium of counting the deaths. So the death rate might not be that high. In fact, we suspect it's not that high. And as we'll see later on, this number here of the 30,619 cases in the Netherlands is open to question. Because what the authorities did in the Netherlands was they took samples from 10,000 blood donations from all around the country. So this was people that were giving blood anyway for use in hospitals. So always, always a noble thing to do, but 10,000 people gave blood uh, donations. And they tested all of these 10,000 donations for the antibody to see if people had developed antibodies and therefore likely immunity to the COVID-19 virus. And what they found was 3% had antibodies to COVID-19. 3%. Now, given that uh, the World Health Organization have said a lot of people don't seroconvert, here we see a lot of people have seroconverted and their serum now shows that they have antibodies. So, yeah, so quite what the World Health Organization meant and what proportion they meant. Let's hope they clarify that soon because at the moment it doesn't quite make sense. But anyway, 3% of the population of the Netherlands had the antibodies. Now, 10,000 is a very large sample size. Now, it's not a representative sample because the sample that give blood could be what we sometimes call a self-selecting sample. But I've been thinking about this and I can think of no reason why blood donors were more likely to contract the virus than anyone else. So I think in terms of viral exposure, they're likely to be quite a representative sample. Now, the population of the Netherlands is 17.3 million. And 3% of that, according to my calculation, is over half a million people. So the number that have been diagnosed with testing, we can see is what, 10, 15 times less, perhaps, than the number that is probably actually infected. So I haven't done the sums, but that's about times 15, isn't it? And we have been saying this for quite some time on this uh, on this uh, video series that perhaps 10 to 20 times as many people are actually infected with the virus than are showing up on the testing statistics. So I thought that was really quite interesting. Now, we noticed that if there's that many deaths and that many cases, that gives us 11.2%. So 3,459 is 11.2% of 30,619. But if the actual number of cases, as now looks likely, is over half a million, then that brings the death rate down to about 0.66%. Encouraging. And we are starting to see this in quite a few studies now. So I'm starting to suspect that at the end of this pandemic, when we look back in a couple of years time and we look at the total number of deaths, which we'll then know, and we look at the total number of people that had the infection at one point, which we'll then know if we have universal antibody studies, then I suspect that this is the kind of death rate we're probably going to be getting in European countries. It's starting to look that way now. And this is quite large scale data now. So this is starting to get firmed up, I believe. 10,000 is a big number. I do believe that's representative. So it's starting to look like, and we've been speculating about this for months now, that the final death rate might be round about just over one in 200 people that get infected end up dying from COVID-19, at least in Europe. So 
Fascinating study there from the Netherlands. Now, China. Um, well, we know there's question marks over the data from China, to be quite polite about it. But they've recently announced that they underestimated the deaths in Wuhan by 1,290. And they're now saying that the deaths in Wuhan, the centre of Hubei province, of course, the epicentre of the entire global pandemic. They're now saying that there was a total of 3,800 deaths, bunking that up by, bunking up by uh, nearly 1,300. I'll leave you to uh, believe that as much as you like, but it's obviously getting nearer the truth. And for some reason, China have added another 325 confirmed cases, presumably due to testing, claiming that that is the number of total confirmed cases in the country. Enough of that. Now, the US. Um, very concerning. Um, I was just looking on one of these flight apps this morning that show you where there's live flights, and there was flights all over the US, unfortunately. A lot of domestic air travel going on there, which, of course, is going to... Well, I, I can't see that it's why well, you wouldn't have guaranteed spread with air travel. It's just too close an environment. Right. Uh, now, the um, president is saying no, nationwide uh, we're past the peak. Time to reopen. And he's talking about liberating states. I'll leave you to decide if this is useful language. Deaths in the States, I'm afraid, is 37,000 and it's going up. Tragic situation unfolding in the United States. Testing is being ramped up, getting on for 4 million tests. But of course, you've got to bear in mind in terms of the population, it's not anywhere near where we need it to be. But the trend is upward, so I'm not knocking that. 33,000 National Guard deployed in varying supporting duties around the country. Deaths in New York City, um, 13,202. And this is including suspected deaths as well as those formally diagnosed through serological antibody testing. But there's no reason to assume the doctors in New York aren't correctly diagnosing this condition. And the governor of New York State is saying the situation with testing and the relationship between the federal and the state governments. And this was his word, not mine, mayhem. So let's hope that situation is going to be improved and there's going to be more coordinated response. Because at the moment the governor is not happy. Definitely seems to be tensions within the American systems that are not helping with a unified response to this pandemic. I'm not knocking America, we'll see other problems, one from my country later on as well. I'm just really concerned that this is going to go so much higher. Now, this is fascinating, and I will conclude uh, include a link as always to the, uh, to the, ad, to the article. This was a Boston homeless shelter, Massachusetts. Pine Street Inn homeless shelter, Boston, Massachusetts. And a small cluster was identified in the area. So what the authorities did, they went and tested everyone in this uh, homeless facility. They tested everyone. And they tested 397 people. And 146 of them were positive. That's 37% were positive. Now, in a way, this isn't that surprising because I don't know what the conditions are like in Pine Street Inn, but I suspect that people do live in fairly close quarters. So as is would be the case in a care home situation, once there was some, some community spread there, it would spread very rapidly. So I don't think we can generalise that to the whole population, but I think it means that it's higher in the population than we'd thought. Remember, we've just seen 3% in Netherlands. And yesterday, if you watch it in detail, I reported, um, I did a whole programme on the, uh, the maternity situation in New York in a maternity hospital in New York where 
many women admitted were uh, asymptomatic but carrying the virus. Now, this is what's really fascinating here. These 146 people, 37%, at the time of testing, it's just a few days ago, I'm not, check on the article for the date, but they were all asymptomatic. None had symptoms. So as we looked at in the New England Journal of Medicine study yesterday, it's looking like the number of asymptomatic people is much higher than we had previously thought. And as we've said many times, people without symptoms, it's great for them. They'll get the virus. Hopefully they'll develop antibodies. Hopefully they'll develop immunity. But of course, they can be spreading it on to other people. That's the downside. That's why I'm in favour of wearing masks now in all public places like supermarkets. I've changed my opinion on that. Um, so a lot of asymptomatic. Now, now since uh, what one of those 146 has needed hospital care. So the last news report I got, still one, four, five of these remained completely asymptomatic. And this is quite incredible. It's looking like there's way more, as we saw in Netherlands, it's looking like there's way more of this infection has spread around than we thought. And it's looking like way more people are asymptomatic than we thought. So this means, this is the good news, that we could be further on in this pandemic than we thought. And there could be much more herd immunity around than we had previously believed. Because if these 146 people all develop immunity, then that's a lot of people to block the infection. That, that's a good starter in the direction of herd immunity. And herd immunity, let's be clear, is the only way out of this pandemic. By people getting the infection and becoming immune or by people being immunised via vaccination. They're the only ways that things are going to get completely back to normal. So that was fascinating. And on a similar vein, Stanford University. Now, Stanford University is in uh, California. And um, it's a very prestigious university. It's quite a, I think it's what Americans call it, a red brick university. It's one of their posh ones anyway. So it's, it's a very prestigious university in California. Now, the proviso here is this is not peer-reviewed data, but Stanford wouldn't publish rubbish and it's being peer-reviewed now as far as I know. So I've no reason to doubt this data at all. If uh, Stanford University have published it, I'm pretty happy and uh, I think the peer review will substantiate this view. Now, what they did in uh, Santa Clara County, California, they tested uh, at random 3,330 people. Now, rest assured, Stanford University know how to pick a random sample. I have no question that they picked a genuinely random sample. And they tested them for zero conversion. They tested them for the antibody, just for the finger prick test and an antibody test. I don't know where they got the antibody tests from. I know the Californians have bought a lot from um, South Korea. Therefore, they're probably very good ones. Now, get this. Infection with COVID-19 by the people who've had the antibodies is 50 to 80 times more common than official figures. So 50 to 80 times more people have been exposed to the virus than have been detected with previous testing. So Santa Clara had 1,094 confirmed cases and 50 deaths. These are cases confirmed presumably entirely by the earlier antigen testing for the presence of the virus itself. And uh, 50, 50 as related to that number there gives 4.6% death rate, case fatality rate of 4.6%. But the antibodies, if you scale up to the population of uh, Santa Clara, which is more than reasonable to do, and which is highly likely to be accurate, given that Stanford University would choose a very representative sample, so the scaling up is entirely legitimate thing to do and is almost certainly correct. Uh, antibodies indicated that between 48,000 and 81,000 people were infected by early April. Not that. So 50 to 80 times more actually were infected than had been detected. Interesting. 
Now, if this is the case, what I've worked out is with 50 deaths, the case fatality rate of its 48,000 would be 0.1%, 1 in 1,000. And the fatality rate of it was 81,000 people infected would be 0.06%. Now, to be fair, this death rate will rise because we know there's this big, long lag time with deaths after infection. But indicating that about 3% of the population there is probably already exposed to the virus, so way more than we thought. Now, to get herd immunity, we're probably going to need 60 or 70% of people to be infected. So we're nowhere near getting herd immunity now. Now, I get complaints every time I say herd community. People aren't cattle. Don't be offensive. But it's the term the epidemiologists use, so I'm not changing it. Herd immunity is the official proper term. It's not me being bigoted. It is the official medical term. So um, interesting, but we're not near herd immunity yet. But given that there's that number of deaths, that means that it looks like many fewer people are getting sick than we'd thought. Many fewer people are becoming critical than we'd thought because the numbers of people infected are so much higher than we'd thought. And therefore the deaths rates are much lower than we'd thought. But these could well increase and almost certainly will increase as, as we've noted, unfortunately. So um, interesting. This death rate could end up at around about 0.5% as we've already noticed in this in this video, as things are starting to somewhat clarify now. Now the UK um, 109,000 cases, so it's a lot. Uh, that was the deaths up till uh, day, day Saturday. That was the deaths up till Friday. That was the deaths up till Thursday. So we're going on at about 850 deaths a day in the UK, and that brings the total up to 14,576 as of Friday. So uh, new figures will be published this afternoon. And uh, we expect that to go up by another eight or nine hundred, unfortunately. But of course, these figures for the UK are only in hospitals. Many, many are also dying in care homes. And some people say you could add 50 percent to that. I don't know. That's not official data, but that's what some news outlets are saying that there could already be over 7,000 deaths in UK care homes. So that would put that figure up to 21,000, wouldn't it? More than. Now, Scotland has released figures. <coughs> they're slightly ahead on and they're figure collecting. And they're saying 25% of deaths occurring in care homes. For every 100 people that die in Scotland, 25 of them are dying in care homes. UK lockdown is extended for three weeks. 19,000 people currently hospitalised. This has been going down for a few days, which is encouraging. Now, again, this is from a news outlet. It's not from a medical journal. And we will get some more uh, ICNARC data soon this week. That's the, uh, the intensive care research and monitoring uh, service in the UK. Um, but one in three critical patients are from ethnic minorities. And no one seems to be talking about vitamin C. All the people from ethnic minorities, virtually all, are going to have darker coloured skin. Darker coloured skin makes vitamin D more slowly in sunlight. Why are people not talking about this? I'm really bemused. There just seems to be this huge gap between the evidence that is emerging and uh, people just don't simply seem to be talking about it. I really don't hope it's not people trying to be sensitive about skin colour due to political correctness, because it's no time for that. People are dying here. I hope it's not that. But this needs to be recognised. And if it's vitamin D, then it's easy to correct. Now, Chris Whitty, our chief medical officer, on the 12th of March said... Community testing is not needed. Now, this is actually quite incredible that the chief medical officer would have said that. If he misspoke, I don't know. Maybe it was just because he was short of tests. 
but he did say pivotal testing needs to be towards the sick. Maybe he just didn't have enough tests to go around. But whatever, it seems to me that the policy in the UK has now changed because we're moving towards the 100,000 tests per day. And that means we can do community testing, contact tracing, isolation, which should be the, now seems to be the policy. So it looks like the senior medical authorities in my country have changed their mind. There you go, they seem to have changed their mind. And the more testing we get, the more we can start easing the lockdown because we can be more precise in isolating those that need to be isolated rather than everyone. And the R0, this basic reproductive number that we looked at many times, in my country, they're not quite sure where it is now. The chief scientific officer, I think it was yesterday, said it's between 0.5 and 1. So if it's 0.5, that's good. That means the infections are going down. If it's 1, it means the number of infected people are staying the same. So still quite high level of uncertainty there about the effect of the lockdown. I think it's fair to say without the lockdown, cases would have dramatically increased. I don't know if there's any question about that because the R0 was about 2.6. And of course, the R0 is the average number of people that one infected person infects. So if we've gone from 2.6 to 1, that's good. But we need it to be less than 1 for the numbers to start dropping. I suspect it may be less than 1. I'm suspecting it's about 0.6 at the moment, actually. And the reason I suspect it's about 0.6 is is that the hospital admissions are going slightly down and that there is a lag from when people first get infected to when they get sick enough to go to hospital. Uh, sadly, not yet filtering through to the death rates, though. So it looks like we're in that lag now where less people are being infected. Few less people are getting very sick, but we haven't yet reached the point where less people are dying. But we will, we will. These numbers will go down soon, uh, I hope. Now, the UK government, I'm just going to whiz through these quickly. Um, UK criteria for lifting lockdown, uh, adequate NHS capacity. So they'll lift the lockdown if the NHS can cope with the number of sick people we're going to get. Actually, I mean, what this means is the government intrinsically understand that the more you lift the lockdown, the more people are going to get sick. And they seem to be adjusting the degree of lockdown to suit the capacity of the NHS so that the sick people can be treated. They want to see a sustained fall in death rates. That means we're well past the peak of infectivity because we know the death rates are the last thing to fall. Data showing rate of infection is decreasing, they want. So that, that would actually come from the, the death rate and from community testing. Um, testing capacity and personal protective equipment must be adequate, especially the testing. Well, but we need both, of course, uh, because we don't want to risk a second peak that will overwhelm the NHS. So they're the kind of policy background that the NHS, uh, the, the UK government's working on. Now, Belgium are also very good at reporting their cases. Um, 36,000 cases. I mean, obviously, there's going to be more cases than that, but they're good at reporting deaths. So that's all the deaths. So I expect this final figure in Belgium, when we know that there's actually way more cases than this. So let's suppose there was 10 times more cases than that. That, that would put that down to a case fatality rate of 1.42%, which is probably much nearer the mark. But I suspect that, as in the Netherlands, it's not 10 times more people than that in Belgium infected. I suspect it's times 15 times more people than that infected in Belgium. I suspect. And that will give us a death rate of, I haven't done the sum, but probably under 1%, which I believe is what we're looking at as we've looked at from other data in Europe. Might be wrong. I do hope it's not higher. Because the death rates include suspected clinically diagnosed cases in Belgium. Now, uh, Germany. Um, Germany, a lot of cases, relatively low death rate. But again, even though the testing in Germany is quite good, the real number is going to be higher than that. But then more deaths are going to occur as time goes on. It's much the same situation as we've seen before. So the Germans have got good levels of testing, tracing, containment and information. It's the, it's the testing, yes, but it's what you do, how you target that testing. And the Germans seem to have been particularly good at targeting testing to facilitate tracing of contacts, containment and spreading information. So once you know who is infected, you can contain them. 
but once the virus becomes visible. It's also possible that initial infections are in a younger demographic in Germany. Now, some shops are opening, schools are hoping to open in a couple of weeks, gatherings will still be banned, uh, pubs and cafes still closed, the Germans are monitoring the R0. Now, this is fascinating because a bit like seems to be the undeclared policy in my country, is they're monitoring the R0 to see how many more people are being infected. So they're going to lift the lockdown, hoping that the contact tracing, the testing, the containment, the targeted containment, uh, the quarantine isolation of contacts is going to keep the, the R0 down, this reproductive number down. And they seem to be aiming for an R0 of about 1.2. Now, I might be wrong about that, but that's what seems to be what's coming out from the German authorities. In other words, they're happy for a bit of ongoing infection to generate ongoing herd immunity because the only alternative is maintaining mass lockdown, which we simply can't afford. So it's kind of an interesting titration that seems to be going on now amongst uh, European politicians. We can open up a bit. That's going to mean more infected cases. Yes, we accept that. But as long as the health facilities can cope, then we're going to kind of titrate it with what we're able to cope with. Will that mean more people die? Yes, it will. Compare that to the alternative of keeping locked down until we get a vaccine next year, though, and that's... I'm just glad I'm not a politician. You see the complexity of this situation. But that seems to be what they're doing. And, and of course, at 1.2, herd immunity will gradually increase. But the herd immunity will increase at a rate at which the health services can cope with. So reading between the lines, that's the strategy that's going on here. Interesting. I am so glad I am not a politician. I would hate to make those kind of decisions. France, a lot of cases, a lot of deaths. Now, this is a theme throughout today's news, really. Half of the deaths in France in care homes. And this is the same in uh, the United States, Canada, Spain, Italy, the UK. Well, I'm not saying it's half in all these areas, but it's high in all these areas. This is a major cause for uh, concern, the huge death rates in, in care homes. And what we're not hearing much about is the rates in prisons. I hope that news is being uh, allowed to come out because um, I've always been worried about these total institutions. Care homes is an obvious one with vulnerable people, but even on, on the, uh, the aircraft carriers, the, 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 uh, the Theod Theodore Roosevelt and the uh, Charles de Gaulle, we saw a lot of cases in young, fit sailors. Now, I um, haven't had time to study Ecuador and South America a lot, but things are concerning there. So these number of cases and deaths in Ecuador, I suspect, aren't accurate. But what does seem to be accurate, again, this is from news outlets, not from scientific journals. Uh, the death rates seem to be seven times the normal in some places. So it does look like people are dying in poorer uh, Mesoamerica and uh, Latin American countries. Very, very, uh, very disturbing if it turns out to be accurate. And it does seem to be that death rates are seven times normal in, in some cases. That is, uh, that's a pretty frightening statistic. What it means is if there's normally 100 deaths in a particular area in a month, there will be 700. It's a big increase. Spain, um, we know Spain's been a terrible epicenter. And they're starting a bit of a lifting again. So uh, construction has restarted uh, in the building industry in Spain as they do a, a careful, phased release of lockdown as is happening and being mooted in different places in Europe. Italy, much the same. We know, we know the story in Italy. Uh, bookshops and children's clothing shops are now opening. So again, a very tentative um, attempt at restoration of normal life. And this is what I've said, the European titration. This is what seems to be happening here. So the reopening is going at a, at a rate at which the health service can cope with. But that does mean people will get sick and people, more people will die. But herd immunity will develop. So Europe seems to be titrating the uh, ability of the health services to cope with the easing of the lockdown. Presumably if the health service can no longer cope, then they'll have to strengthen the lockdown again. Hopefully they won't need to strengthen the lockdown because it will be replaced by targeted testing. 
Right, nearly done. Quick, quick review of Israel. Israel been fairly well contained so far. Um, 158 deaths. Number of new cases is down from 765 at the peak a couple of weeks ago. So it's well down. The number of new cases are down quite significantly. But of course, this with it is with a stringent uh, lockdown. But the number of new cases are down. 158 people are hospitalised, moderate condition, 181 in intensive care, 137 people ventilated apparently in Israel. Testing about 10,000 per day, but they realise the importance of that, of course, and they're increasing that to 30,000 at the moment. And Israel is developing a vaccine as well. Let's hope they're progressing well with that. Now, uh, one thing that was very encouraging in Israel, if there's one positive case in a retirement home, they test everyone. Now, that's encouraging because that means we can have targeted isolation, something that's been lacking in uh, other advanced Western countries, as we've noted. Masks are mandatory everywhere, which I agree with. I really feel the UK government is behind the curve on the evidence on masking now. And they're talking about gradual easings from Sunday. Now, two more and we're done. If you're still with me, thank you. You're doing very well. <laughs> Now, th this was just alarming. Now, I'm going to paste the link to this uh, for the news. On. I can't show you the photographs, they're copyrighted, but I'm, go I'm going to um, paste the link and you can click on it yourself. So, um, one lakh, that's 100,000 people in, in uh, sort of Bangladeshi Indian speak. 100,000 people attended the funeral of this Islamic scholar whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Uh, there was crowds for almost two kilometres on the Dakar to select road and if you look at the pictures they were absolutely solid cheek by jowl as we would say in England this means guaranteed spread the police said they were overwhelmed and when 100,000 people started arriving for this funeral they couldn't contain the crowds and they were all crammed together we really do have to for a period of time, rise above these cultural tendencies. We have to kind of suspend many aspects of our culture until we get a grip of this pandemic. Because it, this reminds me of Mardi Gras in New Orleans, where there was crowding on the streets. And we know the consequences of that. There were more cases, more people got sick. There's more critical cases, more people died. Why should it be any different in Bangladesh? I don't think it will be any different in Bangladesh. And the crowded conditions in Bangladesh for spreading frightens me. Right, last country, New Zealand. Now, I'm kind of umming and ahhing whether New Zealand can eliminate this virus or not. Uh, it'd be great to think they could. Um, low death rate, as we know. Uh, Jacinda Ardern is looking into loosening very tight lockdown. And this is going to depend on random testing to assess community spread. Now, this is good random testing. So New Zealand really has done very well. And uh, of course, the, 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 the infection arrived there a bit later, so they had more warning time. But uh, it looks like New Zealand, to some extent, has learned from the mistakes of others. Now, if you're still with me, thank you. I'm just going to close on a couple of nice pictures from New Zealand. Uh, Sent in by Sarah of uh, nice quiet parks in New Zealand as people obey the lockdown regulations. Which of course is great to, great to see. Just for a period of time, then as with the rest of us, we can start enjoying our parks again.